Good morning, First Pentecostal. It is a blessing just to be here this morning. God woke us up and we're able to come together one more time. Let us give God the praise. Raise your hands. Clap your hands if you want to and just bless his name this morning. For God is a wonderful Savior and we love him. This morning, I have a message for you. And my message is, why me, Lord? I know some of you have thought about that. But this morning, you're going to get your answer. Why me, Lord? Let us bow our heads to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we say thank you. We thank you, dear God, because you are a wonderful Savior. And we are so happy that we can come together and share together your word. God, we thank you because we realize without you, we wouldn't be able to do anything. But God, knowing you, it has been a difference. We pray, God, as I bring forth the word, that you will continue to hold our people together, help them to open up their minds and hear what you have to say this morning. For we ask these things in thy precious name. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, dear God. Hallelujah. Our scripture reading this morning is Acts 12, 1 to 19, 24. Now about the time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard, guard po posts, they came to the iron gate and leads to the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and went down on the street. And immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda 
came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. But the word of God grew and multiplied. My text will be taken from 24th verse. But the word of God grew and multiplied. What have I done to deserve this? I can remember hearing my mother saying these words during times when she was going through. She would say, why me, Lord? I must deserve this. But God, in that difficult time, was with her. And maybe you've heard or expressed this question yourself. The situation could have been the death of a loved one or just a difficult situation at home. Maybe death have come expectantly, tragically, and you are totally unprepared for it. You may have asked God, why did he or she have to die? What did she do to deserve this? Why me, Lord? What have I done to deserve the trouble I'm having? In many cases, the simplest and most complete answer to that question is nothing. You may have done nothing to deserve the trouble you're experiencing. In the Old Testament, people believed that goodness was rewarded and evil was punished in this life. This belief is seen in the approach of the comforters who came to visit Job in his time of great trouble. Each of them let him know that he must have sinned in some way to deserve all that was happening to him. But Job maintained his innocence to the end. Job's counselors have not all died off. That same approach is often taken today, and there are many among us who think like they thought. To help us deal with the why me question, let's look at the word of God in Acts 12, 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. At first glance, this does not seem to be such a significant verse, but we will see later that it tells us a great deal. In Acts 12, we are told that the persecution in the early church switched from religious persecution to political persecution. King Herod became involved. Peter had been in prison and the church had prayed for his release. In the midst of his persecution, the church grew. With this in mind, we can begin to come up with some answers to the question, why me, Lord? First, let us examine 
a theological answer. God owes us nothing. We make the assumption and act as though we deserve goodness, blessing, and a carefree life. We act as though God is obligated to us. We never question why all of the good we experience happened to us. It's only when something bad happens that we question God. We just seem to assume that we will experience the good things of life. All good things that we experience come from the grace of God, as indicated in James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift come from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. We cannot buy grace, and we do not deserve grace. He has given us grace because He loves us. We must recognize that all of our good works cannot be used to manipulate God. We cannot put God in debt. An example can be found in the story of a man who expressed his disappointment with God to his pastor. The man had dropped out of school in sixth grade. His great ambition in life was that his six children would have a good education. By that time, three of the six children were old enough to have graduated from high school, but none had received a diploma. One had married early and joined the armed services. Another had married and divorced already. The third had not married, but was awaiting the birth of a child. The man expressed his disappointment saying, I just don't understand it. Ever since I became a Christian, I have tried to serve God. I served as a deacon, taught Sunday school, and I always pay my tithes. I don't understand why God is doing this to me. Implicit in this statement was the belief that God was obligated to bless him because he had served him. How many of us have the same thoughts as this troubled man? We think because we work in the church, doing what we call God's work, that he owes us something. We think that the more we do, the more blessings we are entitled to. This is absolutely untrue. We can never by the blessings of God. Whatever we receive is solely because of his grace and mercy toward us. He owes us nothing. Next, let's consider a psychological answer to the question, why me, Lord? At those times when you feel like a victim, like life is not fair, and God is not giving you what you think you deserve. Try this simple exercise. Count your blessings. Get a pen or a pencil and begin to write down everything you can think of that you can be thankful for. Enumerate the many blessings he has already bestowed on you. A profound result can come from this simple exercise of counting your blessings. You may discover that more good things have happened to you than bad. Whatever the balance between the joy and suffering you've experienced when you count on your blessings, it will be evident that God has graced you. He has been more than good to you. Counting your blessings will help you to get in the proper perspective. Too often we get stuck in pity party and we get tunnel vision. 
thinking that only bad things happen to us. When in reality, God is good and he is with us, even when he allows us to go through the trials and tribulations. Jesus told us, John 16, 33, that we would have tribulations. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We all have things we will have to go through. Just as we have many joyful experiences, disappointments, and tragedies are also a part of life. But we must remember that God knows what he is doing and he has promised never to leave us. So far, I've shared two answers to the question, why me, Lord? The theological answer is that God owes us nothing. The psychological answer is to count our blessings. Next, let's consider the emotional answer which is to develop positive attitude of gratitude for all the good gifts we have received from God and to make a decision that we will live in faith. Notice the early church in Acts 12. They did not go into hiding or cease witnessing or stop their outreach when confronted with the persecution of King Herod. Instead, during that time, they grew and were strengthened. They lived by faith. The text in Acts 12, 24 says, it's simply, but the word of God grew and multiplied. In our time of trouble, we tend to look inward and feel that we are the only ones experiencing difficulty. Then we want to know what we have done to deserve our troubles. And as it was with Job, those close to us may point the finger and tell us that we have done something to deserve our trials. But we can look outward and upward toward God and live in faith, knowing that he always goes with us. Trust God and know that he has a plan and that his plan is perfect. As Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together. For good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And further down in the same chapter in verses 37 to 39, we are assured that we have the victory and nothing can separate us from the love of God. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Job never did find the answer to why he suffered, but we read in his response to God in Job chapter 42 and verse 5. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. He had found God, and that was enough. Likewise, when trouble comes in your life, and you begin to question, Why me, Lord? Look to God. Trust Him, knowing 
that he is enough. When I was a young girl, I remember when my mom, when she said, what did I do to deserve this? As I've grown older and have found Christ in my life, I know that a lot of times we have a hard time and it gets really tough. And I know that a lot of you are having a hard time now. But remember that God is the one that's in control. He knows what you're going through. So we don't have to ask him, why me, Lord? Because he already knows why. But we got to learn and continue to trust in him, knowing whatever we're going through, that he's going to bring us out. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we shouldn't or think about putting words in our mouth. Why me, Lord? For we realize, God, that you're the one that's in control, that we can look towards you, knowing, God, that you have it. So let us remember to be thankful for whatever that we have to go through and believe that God is going to bring us through. That we don't have to use the word, why me, Lord? We thank you for this day. We thank you for all of us that had come together this morning to hear what you have to say. We bless your name and we magnify you because you all by yourself, you are worthy, worthy of all the praise. I pray, God, that this message will touch somebody that's going through now, that they will have the hope, the hope that they need in you. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord for his word today. I hope that you will carry this word in your heart this week. Meditate on it. And in spite of whatever you may be going through, trust that God is good and wants the best for you. Even though he owes you nothing, he chooses to bless you over and over again. Take time to count your blessings. Develop an attitude of gratitude and walk by faith, not by sight. Know that God is with you every step of the way, even during your difficult times. I look forward to being here again with you next week, right here on YouTube. I hope you will join us. May God continue to shower you with blessings and to God be the glory. As I conclude this time of sharing, I want to encourage you to remember to continue to honor God with the giving of your tithes and offerings. As always, you can send your offering by U.S. mail to our church address, First Pentecostal Holy Church, 324 Pusey Street, Chester, PA, 19013. You can also give online using PayPal. If you have a PayPal account, you can help us defer fees by doing a transfer from your account to ours, which is FPHCChester at Verizon.net. If you don't have a PayPal account, you can still use this option by using the PayPal link on the give page of our website at phcchester.org. Finally, I invite you to join us for a time of prayer via conference call on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. The dial number is 646-558-8656.
please be safe. Be encouraged until we meet again. And remember, to God be the glory.